All right, Lord, I choose to obey your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me and my household, in Jesus' name. In your blessings, Lord, I will rise above all that hell has to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. Everything I set my hands to will prosper because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decrease, blessings and increase, bargains and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Awesome. This is uh, the last Sunday of the year, number 52. We've uh, spent the uh, last two months. We've been, we have done theme months, you know, for the last two years, and it's really... Uh, it's just, it's kind of been unique and different, and uh, we've done two months now to discover. Today we're going to discover fasting, and I kind of saved this one till last because I really want to emphasize the importance of it uh, as we start out a new year. Now, we, we've got us a theme. We'll talk about that a little bit later, probably not today, next Sunday for the whole year for 2022. Uh, we're we're going to be believing for some great things in 2022. You know, at the end of a, a year like this, I always reflect on what's been accomplished or what hasn't been accomplished. And, you know, we, we like to um, look at what worked well, what went good, you know. And we, we try to skirt around the issues where, you know, we maybe we failed or things weren't as good as what they could have been or should have been. And um, as a pastor, uh, at the end of the year, I always, I always know in my heart that we should have done more. I always know that it could have been better. I always know that. Um, we had Christmas this year. I told him I wanted it to be a Christmas to remember because we've had so many Christmases in our past that they came and went and they weren't notable, uh, noticeable, notable. You know, and you think back and you remember three or four that was extra special when you're 63 years old and you remember two or three, that means about 60 of them weren't all that good, you know, to that point. So we worked hard at doing that, and I can honestly say that our family had one of the, one of the greatest Christmas uh, together that we've had. We had some extras with us, their family too, you know, we had a lot of laughs, and um, it was, we just had a great time. And the reason for that, uh, the reason for everything is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And when we get him uh, first place in our life, when we get him where he belongs and we trust him, and serve him the way that we're supposed to. I'm telling you, life takes on a whole new twist, a whole new turn. I'll say that for everybody's benefit today. So uh, I'm really looking forward. We've learned a lot this year. I've hit you pretty hard. Sometimes uh, I've talked about stepping on some toes, and uh, sometimes they were they got to us um, more so than what I realized it was going to. And uh, when I I want you to know though, as a pastor, when I preach on something, I get it first. And uh, most of the time, God just preaches to me, and then you just get the brunt of it. You know, I'm the guilty one a lot of times. And so if I'm guilty, I figure you're guilty, and so here we go. Right on? And uh, that's just the way it is. Now, there are two or three prayer requests I want to make mention of before I get into today's sermon. I want you to continue to pray for Gerald Fadler, who's been a great friend of the family, our family, for many years. He's uh, been pastoring, filling in at White Oak for the past year or so. Uh, he's been in the hospital now for two weeks, and he still needs some healing and recovery. Dee Dee Frazier, her husband, had a wreck a couple weeks ago. Uh, ben, I believe his first name is Ben. Now, I'm not real familiar with Ben. We raised Dee Dee here in our church, her and April and Jacob and Jevin. And uh, Charlene was here, their mama, for a long time. And, uh, but we want to pray for Ben. He needs to get well. I know their Christmas wasn't, none of those were as good as ours because of those circumstances. 
Uh, there are some COVID cases around, you know, so just make sure that we don't get too caught up in ourselves and don't forget what the real business is at hand, and that's to pray one for another, okay? Okay? So remember that. Even as the year ends, hopefully their year ends well, and all of us together, we can start out a new year next week, you know, with, in fine fashion. Wouldn't that be awesome? Looking forward to a lot of great things. One of the reasons why that I wanted to preach on fasting today, and probably Kelly's not in here. Kelly or I, one, will teach on, we're going to take this in greater detail, of course, on Wednesday night this week. So if you're available, come Wednesday night. Many of you do come. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to preach on it, and then one of us is going to teach some particulars, and then we're going to formulate a plan for the new year that involves all of you that will search your heart and want to be included in what we want to accomplish in the new year. Now, to fast primarily, nobody likes that subject because it's very obvious that most of us like to eat. Amen. And any time that you talk about fast, our first thought always goes to food because generally speaking, when you fast, that's what you do without is food. Uh, we love food, don't we? Now, yes, today probably nobody's very hungry after eating all that Christmas stuff for two or three days. Um, but I get hungry every day, you know. I, I'm one of them, I like to eat two or three times and then snack in between, right? Yeah. Am I the only one in the room like that? The, the definition for fasting is to voluntarily reduce or to eliminate the intake of food or something of that nature, something that, that your physical body attracts to. Now, primarily in the Bible, of course, it dealt with food and, and drink, food and drink, okay? Uh, I've seen people, and we'll talk about a lot of that on Wednesday night, that fasted. You know, if you, if you wanted to quit smoking, just, just fast from smoking. You can break that habit, all right? And that would be better than you fasting from food. Yeah. Got to have food to live, but cigarettes is just pointing you in the wrong direction. So there are, there are some specific, specific things that God can lead you in to fast from, okay? Now, most of us realize that we've got to eat to work, eat to live, and so you have to be smart when it comes to fasting. And when I say be smart, the best thing that you can do is pray about it and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in regards to what you are capable of fasting from and for the period of time. Because to fast talks about a specific amount of time and a specific purpose. There is a reason to fast, okay? And there is a time that you can fast. If, if there's no sacrifice involved in it, then you can't really call it a fast. Uh, and the, the Jewish nation, of course, had different modes of fasting. Sometimes they would fast, they called a day fast, and they eat nothing between the hours of six and six because that was a, a day, and then night was from six to six in the next morning. They did that a lot. There were also those who did, that had 40-day fast. Jesus fasted 40 days. Moses, we'll talk about him a little bit later, 40 days. We've had a couple here in our church family in the last 30 years that fasted for 40 days. Um, you're talking about tough. Now, that's tough. 21 days is tough. Um, three days is tough. There's scripture in the Bible where they fasted three days, and God said they, they got work to do. They got travel. They've got to eat. So we have to be very smart about that. But I want you to understand right off the bat that fasting is not just about the physical body. When it comes to fasting, it is a spiritual dynamic or discipline that works and works well for the believer when the believer understands what he's doing and will devote himself to a fast. It's a spiritual discipline. Now, none of us likes that word very well, do we? We do not like discipline a whole lot. If you discipline a child, you know, you stand them in the corner, or you spank their bottom end, and most every Christian I know needs stood in a corner some days, and most Christians I know need their hind end spanked on occasion, and God will chastise you if you will let him do that, uh, and most of us would be way better off if we did. Now, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 there is, a, there is a, a description here. I'm not sure what we got on um, camera today on the screen. I can read it. If we, we've got to do some uh, computer work. Uh, we got one back there that's slower than I am when I get up in the morning. It says, moreover, now this is Jesus speaking. He said, moreover, when you fast. And I want you to take notice of that. Jesus is saying, he didn't say if you fast or if you don't fast. He's saying when you fast. 
Now that, that remark alone tells us that Jesus was talking to his disciples and he, he, it wasn't a question whether or not they were going to do it. it. He wasn't giving people an option. Even though we have made it an option in our lifetime, Jesus said, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. It's not about telling people, okay, that, oh, I'm going to fast. You know, when you go to work and they offer you a piece of candy, you can simply say, I, really, I'm not in the mood for that, okay? <laughs> Even though that would be a lie because you would probably be in the mood for that, wouldn't you? So you've got to watch what you say, okay, at certain times. Now, if, you, if you're work at home and you're not among a lot of people, uh, you ought to work at MFA and be on a fast. You know why? Because they cook downtown, and you can smell it two or three blocks away, and it's like, wow, man, that smells good. Yeah, that's, that's old devil. He'll come after you when you're on a fast. I promise you that. No, he said, but thou when thou fastest, anoint thine head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Now, I want you to know something. When, if we took the first part of that, when you fast, with the bottom of that, shall reward thee openly, you'll get an idea why that fasting is a good thing for all believers. Because when you fast, you shall be rewarded openly. If, I were, if you were to ask me, Brother Dale, why should I fast? I can tell you, because when you fast, you shall be rewarded openly. When you discipline yourself, your body, to fast, it is going to produce something good in your life from the Father who is the giver of good and perfect gifts. So when we fast, now the truth is, it does have a lot of physical uh, things with it that are good for the body. Most of us, done, we don't take as good a care of our physical as what we should. That's why that we, you know, we get overweight and uh, we have colds. There's a lot of things that happen to us in the physical. And the saddest thing that I can say about us as Christians is that because we have not fasted much in our lifetime, we have not disciplined our body to take commands from our spirit and soul man. Because when our body talks to us, we pay a lot of attention to it. When your body says you're hungry, what do you do? When your body says you're tired, what do you do? When your body says, when your body speaks... You listen. And yet your body's not supposed to control you, your spirit. So you are a spirit, you have a soul, but you live in a body. So we have a temporary home telling us how to live. We have a temporary, Susan calls it a mobile home. We have a mobile home that's conducting business for our spirit and soul and keeping us from being rewarded openly by our Father. In fact, fasting should be something that is as habitual in our life as what maybe even prayer and Bible study should be to a certain extent. Fasting should be something that we have learned how important it is in God's eyes and how good it is for us to be in obedience to His Word so that our lives line up better with the Word and please God more so than before because now we're actually doing something that God recommends highly throughout the Bible. And that's to fast. But yeah, you know what? It's hard to fast because what you got to do is you got to teach your body who's boss. Because your body's been boss most of your life from the time you were little. Uh, if we had one of our babies in here and they was hungry, what would they do? They would start crying. And somebody would jump to attention and feed that baby because that baby's body says, I need nourishment. And then it just went on and it went on and it went on and next thing you know, you growed up and you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and your body's been bossing you around the whole time. Am I right? How many of you have ever in your life tried to lose weight? Raise your hand. Have you ever tried to lose weight? Almost everybody in the room. And you notice I said tried, right? I tried to lose weight. You know why we tried? Because we never brought our body into subjection to our spirit soul man. 
We forget. I taught on the power of agreement last Wednesday night. We forget that where two agree is touching anything, it shall be done. You need to learn how to let your spirit and soul man come into agreement about teaching your body, discipline your body, so that it does not control you. And your body does not tell you what to do, where to go, when to go, how much to eat, what to eat. I know it's hard to drive by Andy's without your body saying ice cream. My best advice to you is don't drive by Andy's. Don't subject yourself to something that so far you have not been able to say no to. Do not subject yourself to that. Amen? Really, it's simpler than what you think. Let me tell you some, you know, it's, it's like the who, what, whys of fasting. Let me give you a few uh, scriptures. I'm not going to read them all to you. Write them down. That's why I encourage you to always have a pen and paper. A paper. In Acts 13, 3, the early church was praying, and they had all the disciples together, and the Bible says that they met in a room, and they prayed, and they fasted. You know why? Because fasting is always connected to praying, and they needed to receive divine direction. And so the Holy Ghost spoke to them and said, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, to a work. How many times in our life do we need some divine direction? All the time. We're going into a brand new year, and I don't believe I'm the only one in the room who wants 2022 to be the absolute best year of our lives. We want to be the most productive individuals as Christians and what we've ever been. We want our church to stand taller, stronger, more powerful together, one mind, one accord, reaching our community and everybody that we can, filling these blue seats and blowing out our walls if we have to. Do we not? And if we're going to do that, we need divine direction. And to get divine direction, we need to devote some time to prayer and fasting. Fasting isolates some time for us to pray and to believe God. Amen. Now, if the early disciples did it, that's just another proof that we, the later disciples, need to do it as well. Amen. I guarantee you. In fact, we probably need to do as bad or worse than what they ever did when it comes right down to it. Here, these guys, they, they were all pumped up. They've been with Jesus. They got filled with the Holy Ghost in the upper room. God set them out. I'm telling you, they're working miracles. God's confirming their word with sign and wonders. They're gathering in a room, praying together, fasting, because they want more than what they've got. And that's been the biggest weakness of the church of our day is that we haven't wanted more than what we've got. And too often we're, we're in search of something that we can't connect to because we can't hear or receive the divine direction that we need because we literally have not devoted enough effort into prayer or fasting. And most of the time we haven't devoted any effort at all to fasting and our prayer life is not what it should be. And therefore we are the losers. And so we're not openly rewarded because we were praying and fasting, the early church did. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, I'm telling you, they were going through some stuff. The church was in bad shape in those days. One of those times in the Old Testament where they turned away from God and they began to pray. And here's what fasting does. It reflects the depth of your sincerity and desire to see change and prayers answered. You remember what James said? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So if you add fasting to that prayer, what kind of prayer are we going to have? I'm telling you, when we get serious about prayer, you know when you get serious about prayer? When you get into a serious situation. Whereas if we would get serious about prayer, we might never get in that serious situation. We keep putting things off, putting things off, and then all of a sudden we've, we've dug ourselves a deep hole and we're looking for somebody to throw us a rope, stick us down a ladder, whatever that it might be. At least give me a shovel, let me dig my way up. And we shouldn't have never dug that hole to start with. Prayer and believing God is about being protected from what's going on in society and the world. 
It's about trusting God who's able to keep everything that we commit unto Him until that day. Now I know there's not a person in this room that doesn't have somebody in your life that needs the Lord. Amen? Somebody that needs God. Somebody that you love, that you care about, who needs to be in church, needs to be serving God, needs to be born again. Their names need to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's not, we know people, everybody in this room knows people who have problems. Some of them are born again, and they can't get past their past. And sometimes it's us individually. We've got something going on. We don't want to share it. We don't, we're, we're afraid people will find out. We don't want them to know. And God's given us means through prayer and fasting that we can deal with issues within ourselves and we can believe together for other people and we can see things happen. Let me tell you, God moves when the church moves. God moves when you get sincere and your desire is to see things happen. How sincere are we and how strong is our desire? It's not where it should be because if anybody fasted, and I hate to even ask this question, so don't raise your hand. But is there an absolute single person in this room who fasted last year? We talked about it. We did have a couple hands and a couple head nods. Thank God. Hey, man. Next year, we're going, you're going to get pressured, I'm telling you. Hey, man. You're going to be pushed to the limit. Thank you, Father. In Ezra chapter 8, they was going back to rebuild the temple. And I'm telling you, they, Ezra spoke in faith. God, God spoke to him. And Ezra told the king, we don't need an army to guard us. We don't need people to get us down there. I'm telling you, we're going to trust God. And so the minute he got out of telling the king that, you know what Ezra did? Ezra decided he better pray about it and fast. Because Ezra knew. Joel knew. All of them knew, Old Testament and New Testament alike, they knew that the key to getting God's attention is to pray and fast. Jonah marched through Nineveh three days preaching that if they didn't repent, they was going to die. I'm telling you, they got serious, didn't they? Nineveh did. They declared a fast and they started praying, sackcloth and ashes, that God would repent from what His Word said that He was about to do. They got God's attention. Do you need to get God's attention? Do you need to get it? Are you able to handle your problems by yourself? Are you able to handle everyday situations? Not really. You know what? We need God. We need God's intervention. We need God's direct, divine directions. And we need God's protection. Ezra prayed and, and fasted. And it built up his prayer life when he fasted. You've got to believe God when you pray that you can do without whatever it is. And when you're doing without whatever that you're fasting from, you've now devoted time to prayer. Instead of spending 30 minutes eating lunch, pray for 30 minutes. For most believers in the body of Christ, 30 minutes a day would be a large number in their present day prayer life. If you spend an hour a day eating, now you've got an hour a day talking to God about everything that's going on that needs to be talked about. You've got God's attention. Yeah, your stomach will rumble a little bit and grumble a little bit, and then it'll pass away. Because you'll forget about it. You're getting God's attention again. Ezra wanted to enlist God's help instead of having an army of men. And there's never a day of our life but what we don't need God's help. Sure, sometimes we can help one another. There are things I can do for you. I can pray for a Maisie day. I love Maisie. If you need prayer, honey, we'll pray for you. You know that, right? We'll anoint you with oil and... We'll pour you down. We'll soak you through. But all of us together, praying for Maisie, can't do what God can do. Amen. All of us together. We need God's help. We need His protection. In Exodus chapter 34, Moses went up on Mount Sinai. Spent 40 days up there. He comes down with Ten Commandments. He comes down with a love for God's people. He came down and changed man. They was all afraid of him. They scared. He'd been with God without food or drink for 40 days. 
according to God's Word. He fasted 40 days. He got in touch with God. He saw God in a way that nobody had seen God before. Prayer and fasting can bring you into a new relationship with God, one like you've never seen before. That won't come any other way through prayer and fasting. In 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat, I'm telling you, he declared a fast. He called for a corporate fast. He told all the people, just like Nineveh's king did that day. He said, hey, listen, we have got to pray and we've got to fast because we've got a big problem. A big problem. There was an army coming to consume them that they didn't have a chance to defeat. But one. Their only chance was God. And they got a hold of God through prayer and showed their sincerity and desire for God to intervene by fasting. You know what they did? They got serious for a little bit. Because they were in that serious situation and they needed God to shine and to appear. How many times have we prayed, God, show yourself big. Show yourself big. You know what we need? God to show himself big. And you know how we do that? We get them out of our little box when we pray and we fast. We open an avenue for Him to expand His perfect will for all our lives when we pray and when we fast. How many of us have stopped and reflected on the fact that some of what we're doing is definitely not working? Have you thought about it? Some of what we're doing definitely ain't working. We prayed for so-and-so for five years. We prayed for so-and-so for two or three years. We prayed about this for so long. Something not working just right. How come it's not working just right? Because we're not taking it seriously? Because we haven't applied ourselves to do what God's Word says that we should do in order to have what we want to have and see done what we want to see done? How many mistakes have we made in our lifetime because we didn't seek God's face? We didn't devote any effort into finding out what God wanted or what God said or would say about what we were about to do. Because we were not praying and we were not fasting. And when we did pray, we just let it come and go. You know what? You cannot read in the Old Testament with, without reading about the Old Testament patriarchs, male and female, who prayed and fasted. Go to Daniel. He prayed and he fasted. Go to Nehemiah. He prayed and he fasted. Go to Ruth. She prayed and she fasted. Go to Esther. She prayed and she fasted. When you get to the New Testament, Jesus, our perfect example, what did he do? He fasted. Forty days in the wilderness against the enemy, he fasted. Weak without food, he was tempted by stones. Turn them into bread. Could he have done it? He could have, but he wouldn't. He didn't have to. He got a hold of God. He came down off that mountain a different man than what Jesus went up on that mountain. In the early church, throughout the book of Acts, you know what they did? They prayed and they fasted. How come the modern church of our day, we've got away from probably one of the most important traditions found in God's Word that should have been kept? Because the devil doesn't want you to pray and the devil does not want you to fast. He does not want you to take control of your physical body so that it lines up with the Word of God and your spirit and soul man lines up with the Word of God and you become more of who you're supposed to be. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, there's a, there's a very important scripture there. Now, you, most of you know this story. There was a man who brought his son who was possessed with a demon and he'd throw himself into the fire and cut himself and that nobody could help him. And this man thought that these disciples who watched all the miracles of Jesus would be able to deliver his son from these demonic spirits. Now, if you don't believe in demonic spirits, we got a whole lot of good word for you. And so the disciples that were there, and I won't call any names, they, they didn't have the ability. It didn't work. They just did what they knew, but it wasn't working. 
How frustrating is it when we do what we know and it doesn't work? How frustrating is it when the devil says, you're not cooked up? You're not got the connection that you need to have. Something's wrong with you. Well, the devil wasn't lying. He is a liar, but not then. When it doesn't work, it's because we're not connected the way that we should be connected to our Father. In the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, all power I give unto you in heaven and in earth. The church should be powerful today. And it's not. The church should be seeing things happening that it doesn't see. The church has got to come back together to be in one mind, one accord, doing the things God's Word says that we're supposed to do as believers. Well, here comes Jesus. Amen. And the the guy says, your disciples, they didn't have it. They ain't got it. Sounds like something the world would be saying about the church. They ain't got it. They can't get it done. They don't love the way they're supposed to. They don't do things the way they're supposed to. Sure, we're all guilty to some extent, no doubt. And so the disciples, after Jesus cast the demons out of this young boy and they went away, the disciples, they simply asked, how come, what what were we doing wrong? How come we couldn't do this? And Jesus made that statement that was on the board. How does it happen? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. You know, if we've got any common sense today within the church body, we should realize that the devil has been been given more power than what he's ever had. He has more ability than what he ever had before. He has learned, he has grown, and people of our world have empowered him because the devil has none of his own. All true. And the only way that we're ever going to defeat the devil is when we exhibit the power that God wants to manifest through the church against our enemy and our problems. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. The problems that exist are from a spiritual nature and because we are not spiritually strong, because we have not spiritually disciplined ourselves through prayer and fasting, we cannot handle what comes against us in life. And it doesn't leave. It doesn't go out except through prayer and fasting. How many of you have somebody that you just love, just you love them so much? And in the shape that they're in, they're going to split hail wide open. And if I told you today that if you would devote some extra time just for prayer and fasting, for that individual, you would see them saved. How many of you would do that? And you know what? It's the absolute truth. When we get serious about prayer and fasting and we've committed a cause to Christ for a specific need, whoever, whatever that it may be, let me tell you, when you fast, God shall openly reward you. When we fast, there is about a specific time and a specific purpose. We don't just call it fast because we want to lose five pounds. Amen? Amen. I'm serious with you. I'd have to fast for six months to get where I need to be. It ain't about that. It's about seeing somebody saved. It's about getting somebody healed. It's about seeing changes in Congress. It's about seeing our country took back. It's about it's time that we get about the Father's business on, to change our world, whether it be individually, starts right here, my four, and a whole lot more. Amen? Through prayer and fasting. See, the disciples hadn't arrived yet. Well, it's obvious that we hadn't either. Okay? Can we accept that? We haven't arrived yet. But am I on the way? Okay, see, there's our decision today. Am I on the way? 
Am I going to make up my mind? I'm entering a new year. I'm going to be resolved. We used to sing an old song in the hymnal. I am resolved. No longer to linger. Uh, and I could sing some more, but I won't. Yeah, you know what? We need, some, we need to be resolved. That means to have our minds made up in agreement with our spirit man that I'm going to do some things in the coming days, months, and next year that I have failed to do in the past. Yeah, we are to have a list that we can look at every week. And so when we falter a little bit, we can remember what we resolved ourselves to do. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast more. Whatever it may be, I'm going to encourage more people. You ought to set a goal. We ought to get focused on souls and set goals. I'm going to see five people saved. I'm going to pray them into the fold. Or seven people. Whatever it may be. Let God give you a purpose. Put a number in there. Get it in your heart. Don't, and go to bed at night thinking about it and praying about it and realizing that, hey, I've got to go beyond that prayer to fast. And you might not tell anybody, but tell that person, I'm, I'm praying for you. And if you're led to tell them, I'm going to fast, you see me losing weight, it's because I'm fasting to see you changed. Get their attention. Because again, it's what? It's obvious that what we've done hasn't worked as well as what it should have. You know what makes me happy? When I stand in a pulpit, just like this one, and this is where I normally stand, and I see the wife without the husband, but then I see the husband. See, we have failed. Robin, we failed you. Debbie, we failed you. Diane, we have failed you. Sister Tanya, we have failed you. Sister Tiffany, we have failed you. Will you forgive us? When I say we, I'm not just talking about me. We, as a church... We are a family. Their husbands are not here. Why are their husbands not here? Because we have not seriously decided in our spirit man and in our mind that we're going to commit their lives to our prayer life and we're going to fast and believe God and let God work because what we do is not enough without God's intervention. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. Or uncomplicated. It's that simple. Prayer and fasting. You know what it does? Here's what you discover. We're going to discover fasting. The first thing you discover is more of God, who God can be personally. Because when you pray and when you fast, you begin to connect with God in a whole new way. A whole new way. You begin to find the person of God that loves you, that sent his son to die for you. We talk about having a personal relationship. It's not a personal relationship until you're on a first name basis. Until you know what they like, what they don't like, where they spend their time, what they want, what they're... See, a lot of people have been born again, but they still don't have a personal relationship even with Jesus Christ, the way that it should be. But when I fast, you know what I'm doing? I'm centering on Him. I get centered on Him. I get past myself in my little prayer life, and now all of a sudden I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about Him personally. And when I develop a better relationship with Him, I discover who I can be personally. Because I've already figured out most people don't know what you're capable of. Have no clue what you can accomplish. We done discovered this morning that J.R. can... Huh, we discovered some things, didn't we? I think he knew that was in there. But none of the rest of us did. I'd like to see what you're capable of. Personally. On a personal level. You know what else you can discover? You'll discover more of what God can do. We talk about all the things that God has done, and we know that all things are possible to him that believe, do we not? 
And yet we've all still got unanswered prayers because a lot of times we just don't know if God can do it or not. And even though we say that we know that He can, we haven't believed it. We haven't believed it. There's not a person in this room who doesn't believe that God can heal a sick person, is there? And yet how often have we been sick and didn't get healed? I, we believe God can raise the dead too, don't we? I don't see any of us walking down there in Susan's funeral home and laying hands on them. True? We believe that God's bigger than any problem that we have, and yet we what? Ride them out. We ride them out. Because we know that God can, we just don't know if God will for us. And you know why we don't know that? Because we have not applied ourselves to know it. We've not applied ourselves. We haven't prayed it through. We have not fasted to believe for it. And our faith has not grown to that place yet. We discover what God can do. And when we discover what God can do through prayer and fasting, you're going to discover what you can do through prayer and fasting. Instead of being that person that says, I, I can't do that, I'm not good at that, I don't have that in me, all of a sudden you'll find out that you can do way more than what you ever dreamed that you could do through prayer and fasting. Because it changes you. Being devoted to God causes His undivided favor, those rewards that He spoke about in Matthew, to come upon you. You know, we love that scripture in the Old Testament where it said His blessings would catch up to us and overtake us. We love that scripture, don't we? But how come they're not been overtaken, everybody? Because we haven't been where we're supposed to be. Fasting, it requires more. So now, today's message is all about how much more are you willing to give? How much more of you is there to give? See, fasting requires more. It requires more than what we paid last year. And because we didn't do more, we didn't have more. Think about it. If I don't do more, I don't have more. So I've got to do more. And for most of us, we want more. If you're here today and you don't want more than what you've got, then you're probably in the wrong place. We want more. Okay? So we've got to do more. And when I say that, we've got to pray more and we've got to fast more. And when we pay the price... Susan and I talk about this all the time. We know people who's paid the price. Do we not? We know people who's paid the price. Joyce Myers paid the price. Kenneth Kagan paid the price. John Osteen paid the price. There have been lots of people who paid the price. They rose in their success because God rewarded them openly because they were willing to pay a price. And if you study any one of them that's been very successful, they'll tell you how important the fasting is. And yes, it requires more. Am I willing to give more? My prayer as your pastor is that you will. Because the price for more is to be more and to do more. That's the price. Okay. I got all my kids here. All right, listen up, children. As you approach each day your battles, don't let your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is he that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies to keep us safe. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his awesome and wonderful peace. <laughs>